distractions all around us. So many things clamoring for our attention, and you don't have to look too far to find them. Maybe it's where you give your time, your energy, or your money. Maybe it's what you care about the most, think about the most, believe in the most. Maybe it's where you find knowledge, acceptance, or a purpose. We never want the distractions of life to keep us from the truth of God. Maybe it's time for a reset, a fresh start. Maybe it's time to discover what really matters. Well, good morning. I'm glad to have you here, and I want you to know you matter. You really do. And what matters the most is the reason this church exists. So let me start with a question. Are we willing to adjust our lives for the purpose of sharing Jesus with someone? Are you willing to adjust your life for the purpose of sharing Jesus with someone? Now, I know it sounds like an easy question. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm willing. Hang on. Because that might mean that you have to do something that you never dreamed you would do. It may mean you have to adjust for somebody you don't even like. You don't like their ideology. You don't like what they stand for. And all of this is way, the way Paul finishes the ninth chapter. I think it is at the core of what he really wants us to know today in 2023. I don't think there's a higher, more noble privilege than getting to share Jesus with a lost world. I don't think there's anything that matters more. Now, you think about it. I think it's why we're still here. Do you realize everything else that we do here, we're going to do in heaven? I mean, we're going to sing the worship in heaven. Oh, my goodness. Was it not incredible this morning just to hear them lead us into the presence of God? Yeah, they are a blessing to us. And, and think about the, the worship in heaven. I mean, I know somebody might not be wearing Nike six rings, but that's okay. Jaren can rock those all right. He did pretty well with those kicks this morning. But the, the point is, heaven is worship. Well, what about the teaching? Oh, let's talk about that. You know who leads the Bible study on the life of David? David. It's going to be incredible. Fellowship. It's going to be perfect because there's no sin. We're not judging each other. What I'm trying to say is that everything the church does today, we can do in heaven except one thing. And what is that one thing? We can't share Jesus with a lost world. We won't be able to have those conversations or be able to have that opportunity. And so I think that is the reason the Lord has not returned. God wills that none should perish is the way Peter says it in his letter. I just feel like that these verses represent my prayer and my greatest desire, not only for my life, but for us. In fact, I caught myself this week saying, God, if there was ever any words that you would make resonate in our heart, would you make these five verses change our life? Because I believe it represents everything that we are about. You realize everything we should do here, everything we do, should do the one thing that matters most, and that is share Christ with the lost world around us. So that's the way I say it, because I think everything points to the one thing, and that is the sharing of the gospel. Now, we do a lot of stuff here, but all of that stuff is, is to get to that place. That's the end game. What about meeting needs? Do we meet needs? Do we help people who are hungry? Do we help people who are without housing? Yes. But do you know why we do it? For His name. So they have an opportunity to see Jesus and the love of Christ. We are all about relationships and loving people and encouraging people. I mean, loving somebody and having a relationship with somebody is awesome, but if that's all it is, you didn't get the point. The end game is not just being close to somebody who's lost. It is bringing them to the place where they know Jesus that you know. 
So what if we feed the hungry and they die and go to hell? Oh, but they die well fed. But they spend eternity in hell. Just when you think logically and you apply your mind to this, it makes perfect sense. Jesus tells a parable in the Gospel of Luke about a rich man and a poor man. And the poor man was godly and was in heaven, and the rich man was in hell. And he was begging somebody to come. I believe in a hell. I believe it is a literal place. I believe it is the destination for every person who leaves this world without faith in Christ. It's the most horrible vision. I've seen the Valley of Hinnom, which is what it's named for, Gehenna. I've seen it in Israel. It was a trash dump. It was a place where the fire never stopped. I just think the descriptions of hell in the New Testament are so vivid. And if we believe it, why aren't we more concerned about getting in the way of people going there? I want to be the reason people don't go. I want to be the interruption in their life, especially those that I love, that I know. So what you're about to read is how Paul would say this. And I'll tell you what determines our success with this. It's our attitude and our altitude. Now, attitude, you would think, that's a word that we use a lot. That's the last few verses of the chapter. We're going to look at that next week. Probably never heard the word altitude used to describe this passion. Let me use it this way. When you see the world, okay, I mean, you see the, the, the world and, and all the mess and the, 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 the craziness that's out there, and then you see the children of God. Do you see the children of God up here and then the world here? In other words, there's a separation between the two. I, I'll answer for you. I grew up with this picture. I grew up with, oh, here's the church. Here we are as Christians, and, and yeah, we're, we're separate. We're above. And here is the world that's just filled with sin and sinners. That's not how Paul sees it. In fact, that's so wrong. What you're about to read with me, Paul sees himself not only with them, he sees himself serving them. So we're not better than the lost world. We're not above the lost world. We are called to be a servant to them. So watch what he does. In some of the greatest verses you'll ever read from the Apostle Paul, chapter 9, 1 Corinthians. We're going to start in verse 19, just five verses, reading through verse 23. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew. In order to win Jews, to those under the law, became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I become all things... To all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them its blessings. That I may share with them in its blessings. God, I don't want you to just bless these words. I want you to change our heart with these words. And I want you to make these our passion and our life calling. In Jesus' name, amen. So Paul doesn't see himself above the lost world. And believe me, they were just as lost as our world, more so. He sees himself as a servant. Can I take you back to the the text? For though I'm free from all, I've made myself a servant to all. Now, there's more than one word for servant in Greek. But there's one of them that's a really low, low servant. I mean, it's really like a bond servant. It would mean you're enslaved to somebody. Guess which one Paul uses here? That one. 
This is not a word for I'll go in and give them a little bread and then leave and I'm on my way. No, no, no. I'm bound to them. I owe them something. Paul in Romans 16 said he was a debtor to the world for the gospel. Do we ever think about that? You ever see us as in debt to the world? We owe the world something. What is it? The gospel. We do. We owe this city the gospel. We owe every person in this city the gospel. So here are the affirmations that I will make before you. I want you to join me in it. And the first one is, I am not above or better than the lost. I am enslaved, a debtor to them. God help me to never look at somebody on the streets of Orlando and go, I'm better than them. Or look at somebody and go, no, I'm above them. I'm a lot closer to God than they are. No. I want to look at him and say, what can I do to serve them? What can I do to communicate the gospel? That's his whole thing. Now, in chapter 8, he's talking about the church caring for the church. Okay? Because it was like a weak brother, and you don't do this because you don't want to offend a weak brother. But that's not the context of this chapter. This chapter is about the world. What are we doing, and how do we love them? We grew up being told that we should never mix with the world. We were told you don't hang out with them. You distance yourself. Now, there's some great wisdom in that. There are some verses that talk about being separate. But there's not a verse in this book that talks about not loving them and seeking to win them to Jesus. And so what has happened is the church has changed its approach. And now we've become a place where, yeah, the world is welcome. We're going to put up signs and say, lucky sinners, come on in. We're here for you. They're not coming. You driven around on a Sunday? No, not many traffic jams of people getting to church. They're not coming. But yet, that's been our approach. Well, we've got a good message for them here. We're going to love them when they get here. Well, that is, we try. And then there's some modern-day Pharisees. When they do show up, they do all kind of craziness to teach that we are actually welcoming sinners in this church. Well, let me tell you something. As long as I have life and breath and anything to do with this church, those doors are always open to every sinner in this city. Every one of them. That's who we are. Now, is that the only thing we do? No. We go to them. Paul says, I became like them. Jesus leaves heaven and comes to us. When we couldn't get to where he was, he came to us. And you know what he did? He moved in our neighborhood. Literally, John's gospel opening verses says, and the word became flesh and dwelt. The word dwelt among us means he literally built his house in our neighborhood. He came to us. And so at some point, we will understand that's what it's going to take for us. Now, I want to show you a picture, a diagram, because I I, I love diagrams, and they always help me, okay? Okay. So let me show you this diagram. Here we are. Here I am. They're the weak. They're the Jews, Gentiles. Let me just walk you through the words Paul uses. These are those under the law, but he also calls them Jews. I think it's the same group. Might be a little difference in that group, but I think they are all basically Paul sees them as Jews, which he was a Jew himself. Gentiles are those not under the law. They are those outside the law. And Paul says, I will do everything I can. Now, he does mention the law of Christ, that he is under the law of Christ. What does that mean? The law of Christ is you will love others as you love Jesus. You will love others as you love yourself. The law of Christ is a royal law. James talks about it. It says, hey, love God with everything you got and love your brother as yourself. So in other words, there is a compelling law for Paul, but he's referring to Gentiles who don't live by the commandments of God in the Old Testament. Then the weak, who are they? I think he's referring to those who were the social outcast. 
Those who socially struggle, whether they were hungry, whether they were homeless, whether they were the sick. I mean, it's, it's just, think about it. In our setting, it's just those who are struggling and underserved. And I put another circle up there. Who's this? It's your neighbor who puts up yard signs or who they're voting for, and they don't vote for the same person you do. It's your neighbor who you understand is lesbian because you see two girls going in, two girls going out. They live together and they're married. It's your neighbor who is an atheist, who wants nothing to do with God. It's for people we live with. They're all around us. And it's people we work with. You know them. You've been to the break room. You've heard the stories they tell. You've heard them talk about how many escapades they had over the weekend and how many sexual encounters they enjoyed. You mean I'm supposed to figure out how to? Yes, you are. So you can fill in this blank any way you want. But it's the people we live with, work with, and we play. We play golf with them. We go fishing with them. They're all around us. Now, what I'm affirming today is I will never see myself above them. I will see myself first as a slave to them. I owe them something. Secondly, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to bring them to Jesus. Whatever it takes. Now, it's easy for me to say I used to have a bracelet that literally had that on there. And it's still, I still got it. I just hadn't worn it in a while. Why did I wear it? Because I hate wearing stuff around my wrist like a bracelet. But I would, it would make me look down at it. And all it said was, whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. You know, it's easy for me to say, do you know what Timothy had to do? In Acts chapter 16, Paul meets Timothy. He's a young man in Derby and Lystra. That's kind of what would today be Turkey, the southern part of Turkey. And he meets this young man, and this young man had faith. He came to faith probably from his mom and from his grandmother. And this young man was Greek. But Paul was going into Jewish areas. He was going to be in synagogues, and so he had a conversation with Timothy. Hey, Timothy, uh, in order for us to have effect with the Jews, you need to be circumcised. And Timothy says, wait a minute, I didn't sign up for this. And Paul said, you need to be circumcised. It's going to help us reach the Jews. So guess what? He was. Paul, the same guy in Galatians, is fighting people in the church, and he's saying about Titus, another young man in the ministry, another Gentile. And he's saying, I'm not about to have him circumcised. There's no way I'm going to make him be circumcised. So the question is, okay, so why did Timothy have to be circumcised? Titus didn't, according to Galatians chapter 2. You know the answer? The people they were trying to reach. Different groups. Different people. Therefore, there were different things you do. Are you willing to do whatever it takes to be able to reach that group? I, uh, I remember getting a, having a conversation in my driveway over my trash cans on the recycle one and the other one. And it was my neighbor. And he said, hey, what about us having a Bible study for our neighborhood? I said, man, that sounds great. Yeah. What night? He said, well, let's do it on a Wednesday night. I think that works good for us, and I think I've got some friends who'd love to come. I said, well, let's do it. It wasn't like I didn't have anything to do, and I needed another Bible study. But I did. And so we started a Bible study in our neighborhood. And when I walked into that Bible study, they didn't look like y'all. They didn't act like y'all. And when I would tell a story about a biblical character, I could see that look going, wait, who is that? They didn't know what I knew, what many of you know about this book. But can I tell you what happened? Through that Bible study, we've had many of them since that first one. One of the guys in that group came to me and he said, you know what, I, I realize I've never trusted Christ. I've never become a believer. And he said, I really want to be saved. And we had the privilege not only of leading him to faith in Christ, 
we had the privilege of baptizing him. And every time I think about that, I realize, you know, I need to be willing to go where they are. I need to be willing to go to them. Not just say, well, yeah, you know where our church is. If you want to come and talk about Jesus, come up here. No, let's go to them. And so what does that look like to meet them where they are? It looks like this. I'm going to go, and I'm going to be a part of their life. I'm going to go, and I'm going to be a part of their life. You notice the circles intersect, and they overlap. You're not going to be able to turn yourself into a Jew. You can't identify completely. That's, that's crazy. But you can do some things that really help you connect with them. So I asked some pastors to join me in, in a conversation, and this is what I asked them. What does it mean for us to identify with a lost world? What does that mean for us? You know what they said? Number one, the word proximity. Don't be afraid to be physically with them. I've heard Christians say, I wouldn't touch them with a 10-foot pole. Well, you're going to have to get a little shorter pole if you're going to have effect in their life. Don't be afraid to be with them. Don't be afraid to hang out with them. The second thing, culture. Hey, know their culture. How'd they grow up? They might not have grown up like you. They might not have the terminology. They may not know what you know. Their culture might have been harder. Their upbringing might have been tough. And I don't mean culture as in identifiable cultures in the world. I mean just their culture, their home life, what they've been through. I can tell you that every time you get to know somebody, you can just appreciate them so much more. And, and it helps you to understand them. Like, for example, is our culture better than every other culture? No. So when we go on a mission trip to another culture, we go on a mission trip to another world, don't take American culture, take Jesus. Jesus is what saves, not which side of the road you drive on. Right? That's what I'm talking about. And he, listen how we say it. I say it. I'm just as guilty as anybody. Oh, in England, they drive on the wrong side. The wrong side or a different side? Sometimes we have to be very careful that we don't export what really doesn't matter. And we stay true to what really does matter. So culture helps you to know what they celebrate, how they celebrate, and how can you communicate with them. Another one's language. I mean, just knowing the language and being aware. I, every time I go on a mission trip, I pray for the gift of tongues. It's never happened. I've never gotten it. But I need language, man. I don't want to have Portuguese. I can't learn. It's hard. And I know just a little, which is dangerous. It's always dangerous to know a little bit of language. I was in Africa. I learned a little bit of the Bimba language. Know their language. Say one word to them. It means the world to them. And emotionally connect to them. I think this is more important than all the others. Emotionally connect. They can tell whether you love them or not. I don't care who it is. They can tell whether you love them or not. Let's go back to the circles. Right here, this group. Let's, let's just use a neighbor who really is on the different political side than you. They may be so far right Republican, or they may be so far left Democrat. I mean, it's whatever. You just, you know the scenario. What is it that you could do to try to say, I care for you. I, I don't mean embrace what they believe. What can you do that says, I care for you? I was in Brazil. We're walking along. We've got the Jesus film. We're going to show it in somebody's house. And we're inviting people to go in. And there were these two ladies that said they couldn't go in the house. And, of course, I don't know Portuguese. I'm asking the interpreter, who happens to be a great friend of this church and mine, He's serving another church locally. His name is Gil. I said, Gil, what's, the, what's their problem? He said, David, they feel unworthy because they don't have any shoes. I said, well, tell me, shoes are not going to be a problem. You know, what they, you know what Gil did? 
took his shoes off, threw them away, and looked at him and said, I don't have any shoes either. Let's go. I called Gil yesterday to confirm this. Both those ladies gave their life to Christ. And it was just about shoes. You'd be shocked at what tells people you love them. You don't have to embrace their ideology. You don't have to vote like they vote. You just have to know, how can I demonstrate I love you? So for me, that's the challenge. And when we, I took my whole family to Africa. We were in the bush of Zambia. We're living in, this, in a tent that the missionary set up and the pastor set up for us. And it's no, no running water, no electricity, as dark as could be. And they could see everything in the dark. We could see nothing. We had flashlights. And I watched my kids totally immerse themselves in that culture. I mean, it was so cool. I mean, Hannah's running. She's a little girl at the time. She's running around up and down those trails barefooted. I said, what if something grabs her? I mean, my goodness, y'all got lines over here. Y'all got all kind of stuff. And, and you know what my interpreter said? He said, nope, we've eaten them all. <laughs> said, there's nothing around here. She's safe. And so I was supposed to do a marriage conference. <laughs> it was so funny. A marriage conference. I said, have y'all ever done this? He goes, no. I said, has it ever been done anywhere in, in, in the bush of Africa? No. So I get to be the first one to try to do this. Okay. I walk in this little church with a thatched roof. All the women are on one side, all the men on the other. And I'm like, oh, this is not going to work. This is a marriage conference. I mean, you need to be sitting with your wife. And so I told my interpreter, I said, man, we got to fix this. This isn't right. And he looked at me and goes, no. <laughs> this is their culture. This is their language. <sighs> okay. So I start. Well, several of the women were moms. And they had their babies with them. And they start nursing right there. Well, you know, I can deal with that. Then, when they were through, they didn't cover anything up. I went to my interpreter. I said, hey, we got a little problem here. They need to <laughs> kind of cover things back up, you know? He goes, no. That's their culture. It's a sign of beauty for them. And I'm just saying, God, I'm, I'm having trouble. And the Lord spoke to me and said, David... I did not bring you over here to change their culture. I brought you here to share Jesus Christ. And I will never forget that moment of thinking, I'm going to share the gospel. And I did. We have an incredible, they even one night after the service, out around the fire, they had the drums going and a conga line developed. And they said, Pastor, join us. I'm like, I'm Baptist. I didn't grow up dancing. I, I don't know, what, what do I do? God, forgive us. Surely we're not going to hell. It's at church. We're dancing, right? And I said, you know what? This is beautiful. Because so much I have realized I'm not as flexible as I thought. So here's another affirmation from my heart. I will be flexible and yet faithful. I'll be flexible. But faithful to what I know is truth. Accommodate methods not the truth. And that's hard for us to do. And I'll keep the gospel as the goal. Not behavior change. Not that I get them to vote like I vote. Not that I get them to wear a mask. During the season of masks, during the season of COVID, I know why we lost a voice to so many people about Jesus. is because we constantly thought the answer to life was wear a mask don't wear a mask, get the shot, don't get the shot. Folks, the answer to life is still Jesus. It's always been Jesus. And sometimes we get caught in all of this around us. Now, nothing wrong with being concerned and want to help people, but my goal is the gospel. It's not to get them to behave differently. It's to get them to know Jesus. He's got a good way of fixing everything and changing everything from the inside out. And when he does, I will celebrate the results of the gospel with them. The last verse of this passage is just, it's fascinating to me. He says, I do it all. 
for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. What does that mean? That means that every time you share with somebody the gospel, it does something for you. You are blessed. You say, but what if they don't believe? Or what if they... It doesn't matter. You shared. You reminded yourself of the story of what Jesus did for you and how God really loves you. When I came out of my rebellion and really my life turned around, I had a friend come alongside of me and he said, David, the greatest thing you can do to grow is share Jesus with somebody. I said, no, no, it's reading the Bible, it's, it's praying, it's all that. He said, nope. Share Jesus with somebody, it'll be the greatest reminder what a God you serve, what a Savior you have. And you know what? I found him to be true. Every time I share with somebody, it's like, gosh, I get to tell this story again. I get to experience this again. And I think not only do we get to rejoice, they get to celebrate because their life will never be the same. So you know for me, I don't always get to be there when you lead somebody to Christ or somebody in your neighborhood comes to Christ or somebody you work with. But I tell you what we do get to see together, their baptism. And so you've all, you, you may have wondered, why do we make a big deal? Why do we celebrate baptism the way we do? Why do we have a party atmosphere? And it's because of this. I want to celebrate in the blessings of the gospel. I want to rejoice in that. I want it to be so personal. I wasn't there when they gave their life to Christ. And if I had been, you can't see that anyway. How do you see it? It's like the wind, John says, and Jesus talked about in John 3. But I can see their baptism. And guys, I'll be honest. If you want to know what moves me every time is when I see somebody say, Jesus is Lord, and they are baptized. That's the greatest thing that could happen. And I rejoice in it. So years ago, many years ago, I had an idea. What if we bring horse troughs in here? What if we line those horse troughs up here? And we do baptisms right here and call people to be baptized. And the first answer I got was, well, we got a baptistry. I know we got a baptistry, but it's up there. Could we for once maybe bring it a little closer to the people? Could we for once make it a little more personal? And after we work through the logistics, you're going to see what happened. There are some people in this video, they're no longer here. They're with Jesus. One of my, well, a lot of them I love dearly, but one of them in particular, a pastor, Randall James. You're going to see people that were baptized that are still here. Some are not. Some have moved on. And you're going to witness the first time we tried to say, let's share in the blessings of the gospel. Watch this video.
see their face, the look on their face. You see the joy. That's what Paul meant to share in this, the blessings of the gospel. And I hope that seeing that, all of a sudden you begin to think, who's somebody in this circle for me? Somebody at work, somebody next door, somebody you've known, somebody in your own family. Are you willing to do whatever it takes to share the gospel with them? I want us to bow our heads. If you've never given your life to Christ, you've never taken that step of faith, <laughs> You can tell we're crazy about it because we know it changes your life. And we want to help you take that step. We want to celebrate with you. The Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. Just ask him, Jesus, change my life. I believe in you. And I will follow you. I'm repenting of what I used to be. I'm turning, and I'm following you. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. For some of you, you've already done that, but you've never been baptized. We want to share in that blessing. God, I just want to say thank you that Paul has shown us today to do whatever it takes. And there is no greater joy, there is no greater service than to share the gospel of Jesus. God, help us to do it. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, if you're here and watching that, you just said, you know what, I need to be baptized. You don't realize what it does for us. You saw one today. Hey, we want to do that. Let us know. Reach out. You can t text the word CONNECT to 40777. Or if you want to show up next week at Donuts with David, you can text DONUTS to 40777. I'm going to be talking about baptism. I'm going to be talking about what that step is. We want to celebrate, and we want you to know the joy that we have found in a story about Jesus called the gospel. And I want to thank you for being here and being the kind of church that when somebody's life is changed by the gospel, we have a party because heaven is having a party. May God bless you. Have a wonderful Lord's Day. See you next weekend.